So central to supply and demand, that was um, the suggested title for, for my talk today. So I'll talk about sustainability in the agricultural supply chain from a sustainable agriculture initiative perspective. I'll, uh, I'll try to explain what, what SAI is and what it does, outline some of who, who are, some of our members are and why they, why they are current members, and, what, uh, and, and just talk a little bit about some of the activities and also the global links that, uh, that we enjoy through SAI. I'll then switch, uh, switch gears and talk about uh, Ingham's Enterprises and talk about why sustainability is important to our organisation. So the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative uh, in Australia, it's the, we're the Australian chapter of an international group that was uh, founded in Europe um, about 10 years ago. The overall aim of this organisation is to be a two-way gateway for the Australian food and beverage sector in, in relation to sustainable agriculture. We've got three key areas of focus. Um, the first one being about facilitating learning among, mem among members. Um, and that really is one of the most valuable aspects of, of membership. The second is to promote and implement sustainability uh, practices among our members and other stakeholders. So trying to influence our, our direct members and also their supply chains. And the third is to build partnerships and alliances for, for greater, greater impact across the entire supply chain. So we have a unique membership along the supply chain in that we've got input suppliers, We've got agricultural producers, we've got processors, and we also have retailers, uh, which the European platforms now also um, invite retailers to be part of their, uh, their group. We see that this is a, a unique point of difference because we've got people around the table that represent each of those different segments, um, and that, that's not something that you, you commonly see uh, here in Australia. It's very interesting as a, as a processor, for example, Ingham um, has a large processing footprint to talk directly to retailers in the context of our inputs, um, which are also their inputs in, in many ways as well. So SAI, um, really the, the overall aim, I think, of, of sustainability in agriculture is really to meet the increasing food demand uh, globally. So that, that's really where SAI sees, it, sees itself fitting in. Um, we're also a reference group on productive and sustainable practices in Australia. So we, we, we operate as a bit of a clearinghouse for, for information in that regard. And um, we're also interested in communicating signals along the supply chain to achieve better outcomes in a quicker way and that are more, more long lasting. And as I mentioned, we're engaged here in Australia and also internationally. These are some of the sustainable um, agriculture principles. So these are internationally agreed principles that we, we operate to. So it's the typical sustainability, um, uh, the, the, three to, the three bases of, of sustainability, the environmental, the social, and the economic. Um, so land and soil being a foundation one, um, water, ecosystem health, air, energy, climate change, and also chemical use and inputs being the key ones in the environmental area. There's increasing focus on social sustainability. It's a fairly new, a new discipline, um, and we're we're working with uh, with new databases and new metrics and social sustainability in terms of identifying and measuring different social impacts. Uh, working conditions is a key a key part of that, and that's been a key area of focus actually in the last 18 months for many of our members. Um, training and development, uh, economy, animal welfare and health and safety are also the key aspects of the, the social sphere that fit into the, the principles. And the economic, which is around safety, quality, traceability. There's been quite a bit of talk about traceability in earlier sessions today. Um, financial stability, supply chain efficiency, again a hot topic um, this morning, and risk management. Some of the key common issues that we see across our members um, in SAI are around people, um, whether that's uh, attracting and retaining the right sort of people into your organisation, attracting those skilled people, developing those skilled people, um, or whether it's the way that, uh, that people are treated in terms of their employment. Community expectations is something that uh, continues to grow, uh, and in that you can include governments and, and customers as well as consumers and, and communities. Standards and certification. There's a plethora of standards and, uh, and certification systems and constructs um, around the world, and they, uh, there are many, 
many are around sustainability and they are growing by the day. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? How do you pick which standard or certification scheme that you're, uh, that you're going to try and align yourself with? Is there any, any hope of alignment or harmonisation, which, um, which some of us uh, dream of? Um, so that, that's a big issue for many of our members, just dealing with the, um, the sometimes overwhelming um, burden of standards and certification schemes. Um, soils, water and climate, they're, they're sort of more of the, uh, the fundamental environmental issues that, uh, that face all of our members. So some of our current activities um, fit into these four areas. So we're, we're undertaking a number um, of collaborative research projects this year um, on the back of several that were conducted su successfully last year. These tend to be in emerging areas that are of interest to specific members. So they're not something that as an individual organisation you would necessarily get the go ahead to do. But there may be two or three members um, sitting around an SAI table meeting saying, I'm really concerned about this, I, or I really think this is going to be an issue for us in 12 to 18 months' time, not getting any traction internally, let's maybe have a look at it as a collaborative project. So it can be a really good vehicle for getting um, a lot of new information across a group of um, different parts of the supply chain without you know, a single organisation carrying the burden and risk of that. Uh, we undertake site visits and case studies um, of member initiatives and that's a great way for peer learning. Um, I was mentioning um, to Jane over lunch that uh, later this year we're going to see Tassel's operations in Tasmania and um, I think it'd be safe to say we're all quite excited about that. It's almost like a sort of school camp excursion type of experience because we get to fly to Hobart, go on a boat, you know, um, all of those sorts of things. But that's, that's going to be incredibly interesting to see how the seafood industry is dealing with sustainability. Uh, we, we also every year conduct a self-assessment against those principles that were in that, um, that, uh, that previous slide. And we use that as a way of, of gauging our own performance um, and also of, of trying to get some sort of alignment and understanding as to what other organisations are doing and how they view themselves in terms of assessing assessment against some of those, those key principles. And as I mentioned, we have the, uh, the international linkage with the, uh, with the SAI pl platform in Europe. So just on some of those global, uh, global links, um, we find this of huge value. Um, so this is just a screenshot of a, a couple of different initiatives that are underway um, under the, the auspices of the international group. So looking at um, farm sustainability assessment, or, or FSA, now that's something a few of our members have already uh, trialled or piloted um, and tested with some of their farmers, but that's potentially quite a good way of streamlining or, or harmonising, if you like, some of those standards and certification schemes that we're, we're currently involved in collectively. So that's an area of, of interest for the, the coming 12 months as to how that system goes, how, how customers and, uh, and, and buyers use that. Um, looking at, um, obviously, the, the global climate change um, discussions and the outcomes of those, the, uh, the sustainable development goals, uh, seeing where we can get some alignment there, and also uh, looking at water stewardship. So we find that the link internationally is of, of immense benefit to, uh, to our members. So I'll just um, change tack now. So talking about Ingham's as a member of SII, we've been a, a member um, of SII for about two or three years. Um, and we're a, we're a poultry company. We're one of the largest in, in Australia. Uh, and we have gained a lot from being a member of, of SII. Um, and I've heard people comment today in some of the breaks that one of the best things about being here is the networking opportunity that it provides you. So, so often our sustainable agriculture initiative meetings are, are really a great networking session. Um, and the, I guess the relationships that have developed um, in the breaks or during the discussions or on field trips um, have been of, of uh, immeasurable value, I think, to many of us. Um, Many, many sustainability professionals are uh, loan operators, if you like. They, they tend to be, um, or quite often can be, the only one of their kind in an organisation. They don't tend to have a lot of resources or big departments. So being able to bounce ideas off others in similar situations is, um, is great. So what does sustainability mean to a food company like Ingham's? First of all, I have to tell you a little bit about Ingham's. Um, 
So Ingens has been around for, for 98 years. Um, it's been a family-owned company for most of that time. Um, we've, been, uh, we've been owned um, by private equity for about three years now. We employ about 9,000 people. Uh, that's throughout Australia and also, also in the North Island of New Zealand. And we're a, a fully integrated poultry and stock feed business. So we, uh, we contract out the, the, the growing of the birds. Um, we purchase grain. Um, and basically everything in between we, we do ourselves. Um, I've just got a couple of pictures of chooks there, which you, is obligatory when you work for Ingham's. So that, that just shows you, um, I guess, the, the trajectory that the industry in Australia has been on um, over the last uh, 40 years or so. So in the 70s, it took 101 days to grow a bird to full size. And to do that, we needed to feed it with eight kilos of, of grain-based feed. Um, that has been shortened significantly through selective breeding and improved nutrition to, to only 32 days and two kilos of, of grain. So you can see that as an industry and as a producer of meat protein, it's a very efficient, uh, very efficient business model. So some of our key inputs and risks um, include grain, um, land, labour and water. So we see those as really our four big um, sustainability uh, risks, if you like, in terms of inputs. So things that threaten those, climate, stakeholder expectations, availability, quality and cost. I'm sure that many of you know that in terms of stakeholder expectations in particular, that can lead you down a, a pathway that doesn't necessarily improve any particular outcome. Um, and really just satisfies a perception, so that can be quite difficult to, to deal with. There isn't a straight answer for that. Um, but those are some of the, some of the key threats that face, face our organisation. So when you look at it from a farming perspective, um, our farmers are poultry growers. Um, so, so key input for them is, is the commodity of, of grain, um, which is obviously subject to climate and, and other impacts. Our grain itself has a significant cost and ecological footprint, and, and there are also um, soil issues associated with that, as, as Neil was outlining. Uh, so from, a, from an ecological perspective, in terms of Ingham's overall footprint, grain actually um, is accountable for the vast majority of it. Um, our poultry growers, our, our farmers, also um, need to contend with welfare standards and that's a top of mind issue not only for consumers but also for ourselves. It's one of the things that we do pride ourselves on um, and it's a, a very important part of being part of the animal industry is that you take care of the animals that you're, you're, um, you're working with. The, the whole issue of welfare, free range, RSPCA, all of those sorts of things is very associated with the, the concept of, or the construct of natural and sustainable food and that comes through very clearly with our, with our consumers. So while we don't believe there are any issues with that, it can sometimes be um, a task to manage the, uh, the perceptions there. So in terms of risk management, which is really what business sustainability is all about, we need to ensure that our suppliers can manage shocks such as um, drought. Um, we need to, to develop and, and really strengthen and nurture strong partnerships with, with our key suppliers. And we also need to invest, um, sometimes in quite new and innovative areas. If we look at water, water being one of our other key um, inputs and also something that is quite um, readily threatened. Um, so, so water is essential to every aspect of our operation. Whether we're growing a bird in a shed, um, that bird needs to drink. Whether we're producing feed, um, you, need, you need steam to make, um, you know, to, to pelletise the, the grains. Um, or whether we're, we're processing in an abattoir, we, we, we completely rely on water. We couldn't do anything without it. Um, water is obviously very subject in this uh, country, particularly to, to climate impacts. And we know that globally, um, there'll be quite a big shortfall between water demand and water availability. So it's, it's clear that, that something needs to be done about, about water. So one of those responses is to manage it better, um, reduce water use, increase efficiency, um, and do all of those things while you're maintaining the highest, um, highest quality standards um, possible. We also need to go a little bit further than that as a large water user and actually understand the impact that we have as an operator um, on our catchment, the catchment where we source our water and the catchment where we discharge our waste and the catchment where we operate and our, our community lives, where people who work for us live. Um, and we also need to understand how that catchment can impact upon us. 
So that, uh, that reduces our risk uh, in terms of uh, improved understanding of what, uh, what the issues actually are. So we've adopted a, a water stewardship approach, um, which is a new way. It's a new way of doing things, and it's a new way of managing a key, a key input resource and risk like water. It's, um, we've used the, the water stewardship, the International Water Stewardship Standard, and that has helped us to, to demonstrate that our use of water is fair um, in simple terms. Um, often if you're a large water user, you're criticised for just for that very fact and people don't take into account that you could be extremely efficient with it. You could be an incredibly good man man manager of it. Um, but if you're using a lot of it, the perception is where you're wasting it and you shouldn't have access to that if I can't... Um, you know, if, my, my, if I'm being restricted in terms of my water use from a community perspective. Um, so, so using a water stewardship approach helps with that. It also helps to demonstrate to water regulators that, um, that we are deserving of our, our allocation. Um, and adopting that approach, because of that increased understanding of the catchment constraints or catchment uh, issues, also reduces the risk of, continue, of continued supply, which obviously without water you can't, uh, you can't do business. So um, it's a, potentially a big business interrupter. So one of the ways that we've managed water risk is through those new partnerships and also through some of that innovative investment um, that I mentioned previously. So at two of our largest processing sites in Australia, we've constructed um, and commissioned advanced water treatment plants, which means that we reduce our water use by 70%. So we take um, the water that we use in processing and we put it through a series of treatment plants, including um, advanced treatment, which is filtration, reverse osmosis, um, chlorination and, and UV, so that we can use that water back through the process. So that's been a step change for us. It was a significant financial investment. It hadn't been done before in the poultry industry. And that was in response to some of those concerns around water and around the survival of our business, um, particularly during the, the, during the last drought. Um, the, the viability of our operations was, was under threat. So in doing that, we've um, not just done that, we've looked at water use in every area. So now that we're producing our own water, in a sense, need to make sure that we're still being as efficient with it as we possibly can be. So the systems that we have, um, you know, they're fit for purpose. We have multi-barriers. Multi we've got six barriers at that final advanced stage. We've got online monitoring. So we're, we're very sure of the quality of the water because obviously the last thing we want to do is to be um, secure in our water supply and um, contaminating our product. So, so the way that we've built and designed the systems, they're fail safe. So sustainability at Ingham's um, has become increasingly important over the years. Um, and I, I see four clear phases um, within the organisation, starting with the, the environmental management approach in the, in the 80s. Um, and really that went through to the early 2000s, where it was all about reducing risk through managing compliance risk, essentially. Reducing or, or managing utility use, trying to control some of those semi-controllable costs. Um, so very much a traditional environmental management system type of approach. That then uh, grew into looking at environmental sustainability, so with increasing that increasing understanding of things like water, for example. Um, so we developed a sustainability strategy which was integrated with our existing environmental management system. We uh, were one of the first companies to do a comprehensive carbon footprint, which we learnt a lot from. We built the advanced water treatment plants. We underdid, under, undertook quite a lot of uh, new types of work to move into that sustainability area. We then had um, about a five year period of, of implementing that and taking that to the next stage in terms of uh, certif seeking certification against the International Water Stewardship Standard, for example, um, and developing targets, um, particularly around energy and water use. That has now morphed into what we call business sustainability. So we've got four key areas now, which is business risk um, management. So that's looking at strategic risks as well as operational and not, not sustainability broadly, so social, economic and environmental, not just environmental. Water stewardship, so we've shifted our focus from water use um, efficiency or management into stewardship. You still need to manage your environment and comply, so that's still in there. Environmental management is still one of the key pillars. And, and also ethical sourcing and uh, corporate social responsibility, and that's, um, that's largely in response to our large workforce and the need to 
to, to manage that, but also the, uh, I guess, increasing focus, um, particularly in recent times, on labour practices within the food industry in this country. So, sustainable supply to meet demand. So what's the link between supply and demand and sustainability? Well, if you're not supplying something in a sustainable way, you're not going to be, meet the demand because you, you won't be in business. That, that's, uh, that's basically it. So there, as I say, there are some very common themes along the supply chain, particularly around climate, water, soils, and, and increasingly labour. Um, sustainable risk management, uh, well, sustainable management is really about, about risk management. Um, sustainability is about making sure your business is around for the long term, not, not just that the environment is protected. One of the key points I wanted to leave you with is about collaboration, um, and that's, that's been really one of the key benefits I mentioned earlier about SAI, is that if you can work with others, um, you can do great things. Um, all of the other things there, I think, um, speak for themselves, but I think it's the, the collaboration and that connectivity within the supply chain that is going to, to take things forward. Thank you very much.